Hello wrestling fans. Is your friendly robot pro wrestle machine. Back to read another wrestling observer newsletter. Sit back, relax hands and eyes free. Here we go. November 4th, 1991 wrestling observer newsletter. First ever Hogan v Flair match. Paul E returns to WCW by observer staff. Wrestling observer newsletter. PO Box 1228 Campbell California 9500912288. November 4, 1991. As the World Wrestling Federation's advertisement read, for over a decade, millions have been waiting for this match. And now it's here. The first, second, third and fourth meeting of Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair took place in Dayton, Oakland, Los Angeles and Tempe respectively this past week. The historic first match took place without any fanfare, in Dayton on October 22. The Dayton match, the final bout on a 30 or so match television taping, was unannounced. Hogan replaced Roddy Piper, who was scheduled against Flair in the dark match main event. The Dayton match, which ended with Flair winning via count out, took place mainly because both men, the two biggest American wrestling names of this era, who had never worked with one another before, wanted to give it a go before taking the match on the road three nights later. As the last match of a long taping night, it was more get out there and feel out working together as there was neither the time nor the crowd energy for a classic match. The first advertised encounter took place on October 25th at the Oakland Coliseum Arena before approximately 14,900 fans, 13,400 paying $157,842. It was not a sellout nor did it set any kind of a record, but it was the largest wrestling crowd in the building in a couple of years, even with a pathetic undercard. While it wouldn't be confused with a match of the year, and may not have even been the match of the weekend, it was several levels above everything else on the show and didn't seem to leave anyone disappointed. It was only Hogan's second match back, the other being in Dayton, since taking two months off after the SummerSlam pay-per-view show and he seemed to work harder than usual, but not necessarily better than usual. While Flair has certainly had more memorable matches, he lived up to his reputation. It was clear that the crowd was more up for this show, seeing it as something special, than for any regular house show in this area in recent memory. The main event, the battle between the three-time WWF champion and the seven, or is it eight or nine really? Time and WA slash WCW champ was put on fourth, before intermission so they'd be able to do the match, and then make the announcement of the rematch before ending the show. The heat and intensity at the beginning of the match didn't equal that of a WrestleMania main event, but it was a lot stronger than a normal world title match main event on a normal house show. As expected, Hogan clearly was the crowd favorite, but Flair had a core of supporters, estimated, depending on the part of the building you were in, at anywhere from 5% to 30% I'd guess, at 15% although he had slightly more support from posters and banners. Flair entered the ring with manager Bobby Heenan, who hadn't accompanied him for his previous house show main events with Roddy Piper, to a lot of cheers and even more booze. Hogan entered to an ovation typically thunderous, which wasn't nearly the reaction he received at his peak of popularity but still more than enough to drown out the booze. The bell rang and the first advertised encounter between arguably the most popular wrestler of all time and perhaps the greatest wrestler of all time was underway. The match outline was predictable very good heat, generally solid moves, but certainly no surprises. Hogan shoved Flair down a few times on collar and elbow tie-ups. Flair came back with the stiff chops, which Hogan sold. Flair took his flip into the corner, landing on his feet on the apron, running across the apron and getting clotheslined to the floor from Hogan early. The first big break was a typical Hogan match spot. Heenan got on the apron, Hogan went after him, and Flair ambushed him with a knee to the back. Flair did his typical moves, the knee drop to the forehead, hard chops, and working over the legs. The battle went out of the ring when Flair smashed Hogan's left knee with a chair. Flair set up the figure four twice, but both times Hogan kicked him off before the hold was locked in. Hogan made a small comeback, but Flair cut him off with a back suplex and a near fall. Then it was time for the Superman comeback. Hogan didn't sell the chops, punches, kicks and a flying forearm smash. He came back with a few punches, a foot to the face, that missed by a foot a body slam and a leg drop. Just before the three count, Flair got his foot on the ropes. Hogan got up thinking he'd won. As he and the ref argued, Heenan gave Flair the dreaded foreign object. While the fans at ringside seemed to know that there were no television cameras, and thus, no chance of a title change, in the upper deck for that brief moment, the mood was different. Unlike previous challengers over the past few years, at that moment the fans saw the title change as a probability, Flair hit Hogan with the object and got the 1-2-3 at 11.35. The place erupted. There were a lot more cheers than boos. 
Flair was given the WWF belt and announced as the new champion. At that point, Agent Dave Heckner charged the ring doing the overdone pantomime to signal about the object. Heckner grabbed the belt and placed it on the chest of Hogan, who was still laid out as the ring announcer. Heenan grabbed Heckner while Flair put the figure four on Hogan for a few moments, finally making the save with a hammer and the British Bulldog. In their earlier lives, as Greg Valentine and Davey Boy Smith, they were two of the best wrestlers in the business. But now they are simply bloated weightlifters going from town to town in search of a gym to work out by day, and showing up at work each night with no intention of ever breaking a sweat. As Flair and Heenan took off, they helped Hogan from the ring as he sold his leg big all the way to the back. There was no post-match posing routine on this night. I gave the match three and a half stars. Opinions of others who were at the match live who have called in or spoken with me have varied from three stars, four people, three and a half, four, three and three quarters, three, and four stars, two. Most reports are that the next night in Los Angeles, which drew 13,800, 12,400 paying $178,740, was just a shade below in quality. It went 1328 with the same finish but a different body of the match. In Los Angeles, Hogan played Superman a lot more during the early part of the match, which I was told took the match down a tad. Ratings ranged from 2.5 by 2 readers, 3 by 2 readers, and 3.5 by 3 readers. Hogan is self proclaimed eliminator of blood in pro wrestling, then bladed at the end from the foreign object. On Sunday night in Tempe, Arizona, which drew about 5,600 paying $67,000, they went 1230 ending with both men fighting outside the ring but Flair getting in to beat the count while Hogan is distracted by Heenan. Flair grabs the WWF title, but in this finish, Hogan runs both Flair and Hogan off, gets Flair's belt from Heenan and does the posing routine with both belts before kicking Flair's belt defiantly out of the ring to the floor. That match was rated two and a half stars. The Oakland and Los Angeles matches built to rematches on November 15 at the San Francisco Cow Palace and November 16 at the Anaheim Convention Center. When they announced the rematch in Oakland for the Cow Palace, despite the fact the match itself drew a huge crowd and had a ton of heat, the reaction to the announcement of the rematch was mild. When it was over backstage, one wonders what both men were thinking. The match, the subject of fantasy writers' ideas and words in wrestling magazines and newsletters for years, that appeared would never happen, finally has, did and will continue to happen for some time to come. For both, it signals the beginning of a big run. Perhaps the beginning of each man's last big run. For one man, the thoughts just weeks earlier were that wrestling was still going to be a part of his life, but a much smaller part, only for occasional appearances. Like Arnold in bodybuilding. He'd stick around, but he's he wouldn't want to be known as just a wrestler, but instead an actor who rose from his junk sport to superstardom. But reality hit hard, and he's not going to be Arnold. He's bigger than his junk sport, but the best he'll ever be is the main man in his junk sport. For the other, there are no thoughts of any other business, and to him, it would never be thought of as a junk sport. Being main man is good enough. In fact, it's all there is. It's just that anything less isn't acceptable. The ending of a 16-year association with a company, for a decade plus as the main man, was stymied by a front office who decided that day was over because of the date on his birth certificate or because he made a handier scapegoat for problems with the company by those in charge than self-examination. But instead of it being the end, it turned out to be the springboard for a new beginning. This new career may bring him more notoriety than ever before, that some say he deserved but never quite achieved. But the kind of matches that made him what he has had to be checked at the door, only to be retrieved when he leaves the party. The time needed just won't be allotted. The opponents who could do it have become bulldogs and hammers who no longer break a sweat, roosters and blazers who since childhood dreamed and prepared to become the best they could ever be, only to find out that it didn't even matter, dragons wearing a tail drinking kerosene each night, hit men who can do it, but don't very often and tornadoes whose abilities have blown away. Yet, ironically, it is in this environment that he'll be finishing his career. But this isn't going to be any requiem for a heavyweight story. In fact, despite the previous paragraph, in this case, they're going to turn out to be just the opposite. There are several changes, due to injuries, in upcoming major cards. The angle on the WCW Halloween Havoc pay-per-view on Sunday night where Arnold Anderson and Larry Zbyszko smashed the car door on Barry Windham's hand was a cover story because on October 22nd in Columbus, Georgia, in a squash match, Windham landed wrong doing a bulldog headlock and broke his wrist in four places. The injury is serious enough that he isn't expected to return for six months to a year, but he was willing to let them slam a car door on his hand to use the legit injury as part of an angle when he returns. Ron Simmons, who worked Havoc's main event with a bad wrist as well, 
is expected to be out a few weeks as well, and the last word I had is he wasn't expected back for the clash on November 19. Simmons was in a cast until just before the show and became something of a folk hero for toughness for working the match without any protection for his wrist nor did he take any pain pills or shots to kill the pain. Ironically, late in the week there was some concern that Simmons wasn't even going to be able to work on Sunday, or perhaps wasn't going to be allowed, as there was concern about him doing the finish. There is expected to be some revamping of the Clash lineup on November 19 from Savannah, Georgia, with the top matches scheduled as Lex Luger vs. Rick Steiner for the WCW title and Sting vs. Rick Root. The plan of pushing Barry Windham and Ron Simmons as the top babyface tag team had already been changed to giving a big push to Windham and Dustin Rhodes as a team, but that plan is out the window as well. The opponents of the Enforcers is unknown for that show, and I believe the Oz vs. Dustin Rhodes match is out the window, but I believe the rest of the card is staying as is. On the WWF side, Sid Justice had surgery to repair a torn bicep tendon on October 24. He's expected to return around February or March, which isn't enough time for WrestleMania but he's out of the next three pay-per-view shows. Randy Savage will continue to take his place on house shows for the time being, although Justice is still being advertised everywhere and will remain so until the weekend of November 9, when the injury will be acknowledged on television, and all the house shows with him on top after that point will be changed to Savage. Savage will still technically be suspended and work as Mr. Madness, since he won't be reinstated until after Thanksgiving. The WWF has its reasons, mainly because Justice still had interviews and matches in the can that would air on television this coming weekend, and their rationale is that acknowledging the injury on television before November 9 would have exposed that the television shows were taped ahead of time, and they are consistent in their policy even if it still is advertising someone in a main event that they know won't be appearing. Anyway, as for the Survivor Series, Justice is out, as is the Dragon, and right now we've got no word on the replacements in either match although I was told Savage won't replace Justice at Survivors. Contrary to what has been printed elsewhere and just about everywhere, Justice was never scheduled to win the WWF title at the December 3rd pay-per-view show in San Antonio. In fact, Justice was booked originally to appear on the show in a dark match against Jake Roberts, which obviously will no longer be taking place. The top matches on the San Antonio pay-per-view show I believe will be Hogan vs. The Undertaker, that one is the definite main event, for the WWF title, Flair vs. Roddy Piper, Bret Hart vs. Skinner for the Intercontinental title and Ted DiBiase, and IRS vs. Big Boss Man and Virgil. Mike Tyson was injured as well, as you all know, and there was talk last week about the Tyson Evander Holyfield fight being moved to either January 18th or January 20th. The Royal Rumble pay-per-view is January 19th, which would necessitate moving the Rumble pay-per-view. Titan had some preliminary talks with TVKO Time Warner, the promoters of the fight about moving the Rumble date and were willing to do it if TVKO paid a fee, reported in the New York Press as $500,000. But the deal fell through, having nothing to do with the fee the WWF was asking, but because all the various parties involved in making the boxing match were unable to come to any sort of an agreement, and the fight is in grave jeopardy of ever taking place. And speaking of boxers, Former heavyweight contender Trevor Burbick was scheduled to have a press conference this coming week in New York to announce a mixed martial arts match against pro wrestler Nobuiko Takata on December 22 at Sumo Hall in Tokyo. In addition, Atsushi Onita is currently in the United States and wants to sign two heavyweight boxers to form a tag team for his tag team tournament which starts in a few weeks. The name Onita is working on getting is Leon Spinks, the heavyweight champ of some 15 years back who has done wrestler versus boxer matches with Antonio Inoki, Great Wojo and Jerry Lawler, the first one memorable for how awful it was and the latter two which weren't even memorable. The biggest surprise on the WCW pay-per-view show was the return of Paul E. Dangerously, as the manager of Rick Rude and Medusa. A lot transpired over the past week in that situation, which was still touch and go until two hours before the show was scheduled to begin. Dangerously had announced a press conference on Friday at the China Club in New York to talk about his suspension. Two days before the press conference at the WCW Steering Committee meeting, Jim Crockett brought up bringing Dangerously back as the lead manager, a position first offered to Jim Cornette, who turned it down much to everyone's expectations although they did make the offer. It seems to be pretty much accepted by everyone that the company made a mistake in suspending Dangerously for something it seems he never did and there was no proof whatsoever that he ever did and that even if he did it, it wasn't an offense worthy of suspension to begin with. But anyway, rather than be stubborn about holding firm to their position just to prove they can, which they can, movement was made to bring Dangerously back, although they wanted him as a manager rather than a commentator to begin with. According to our sources, Jim Ross, Dusty Rhodes and Magnum TA all agreed with Crockett's proposal which constituted a majority of the six-person committee. I'm told Jim Hurd wasn't hot about the idea at first, 
but didn't try and block it, either. Dangerously held his press conference two days later and made the statement that if WCW didn't at least schedule a review on his suspension within 72 hours, or by the end of the pay-per-view show, that he'd take legal action. By the time he said that, the legit suspension was being worked into a pro-wrestling angle. It was expected by that time he'd start back as a manager, although it wasn't a definite but since the plan was already made for him to be in Chattanooga, one had to assume he inevitably was being brought back. But there were still details of the angle to be worked out, and dangerously wanted to create an angle from his suspension, which wasn't agreed upon until late Sunday afternoon. There were a few shoot remarks by Dangerously in the first interview, although in his storyline he wants his suspension to be because he was too controversial a television commentator and won by Ross as well. Just as we were going to press last week we received the details regarding the departure of Rick Steamboat from the WWF. While the basic particulars of the story were correct, with the brunt of the WWF office on location for television tapings, there is another side. Apparently the WWF was scheduled to shoot its first angle with Steamboat, where he would blow fire at a bunch of money of Ted DiBiase's, at this past television taping. This would lead to matches between the two of them starting after the Survivor Series, Steamboat gave notice more than a week before the taping, more for personal reasons of wanting to spend more time at home, effective December 16th. Later, according to WWF sources, Steamboat asked if he could finish up on November 28th, which would eliminate already booked matches for the first two weeks of December with DiBiase. Steamboat, who agreed to do any jobs asked at arenas, was asked to do jobs for Undertaker and IRS for television at the tapings on October 21st in Fort Wayne, refused, and was history. The WWF slant to it is that they had spent six months pushing the Dragon character on television, and were finally in a position where it was ready to be put into an angle that could help draw money. But when Steamboat gave notice, since he claimed he would be getting out wrestling except for working independent shows near home, they wanted him to help others get over on his way out, and help build ratings for the sweeps period. A story in the October 22nd edition of the newsletter 3 Count, by Alex Merves, which is expected to be reprinted in the Miami Herald this coming week, will be one of the strongest mainstream media stories thus far on the subject of pro wrestling and anabolic steroids. The story talked about anabolic steroids and also the November 5 meeting of the Florida legislature regarding regulated pro wrestling in Florida, which would probably include random mandatory anabolic steroid testing. It's an important issue to raise, said Florida's Committee on Regulated Industries Chairman Norman Ostarau in the story. I'm not looking at regulating an industry we don't need to, but we need to at least identify if there is a problem. I think there is. The story listed the ultimate warrior, Randy Savage and Jake Roberts as among those receiving FedEx packages from Dr. George Zarian in addition to those named previously in the Zarian trial this past summer. Zarian, who is awaiting sentencing on his conviction this past summer on 12 counts of distribution of anabolic steroids and other controlled substances for non-therapeutic purposes, spoke with Merves this past week and claimed the 15 packages sent to Titan Sports headquarters to Vince McMahon and Lord Alfred Hayes didn't contain steroids, although during the trial he admitted distributing steroids to both men, but contained medication. When asked about the packages to Hulk Hogan, Zarian said the truth about those packages will eventually come out, and that he found Hogan's behavior regarding the subject in the media of late to be disgraceful. The story also revealed that Tom Zank is facing six felony counts of possession of anabolic steroids and a seventh charge may be added pending results of the quantities from a police lab examination stemming from his arrest last month. The story also contains several quotes on the subject from Eddie Gilbert. Gilbert said the packages he received from Zarian were painkillers, stemming from continual repercussions from the broken neck he suffered in a 1983 automobile accident. Gilbert's claim is corroborated by testimony in the Zarian trial that he acted as a medical doctor in regularly prescribing pain-killing medication to Gilbert. Gilbert admitted to using steroids in 1986-87 and stopped because of pressure from his wife at the time, Missy Hyatt. She tried to make me realize they were no good for me, and we were trying to start a family. Most wrestlers get off steroids when they want to start a family because while on a cycle, steroids often lower sperm count, in most cases the sperm count goes back to normal shortly after getting off a cycle, although heavy users, particularly those closing in on 40, have been known to have more serious problems in that regard. Bodybuilders and wrestlers now often use a drug known as HCG, human chorionic gonadotrophin, during steroid cycles and shortly after completion of a cycle, a hormone derived from the urine of pregnant women, which is not a steroid, although it is illegal misdemeanor that stimulates the body's own production of testosterone while on steroids or getting off steroids. This counteracts the testicular shrinkage and loss of sexual desire that steroids sometimes cause. The story noted that despite many public announcements by both the Titan Sports Wrestling Company and Bodybuilding Company, dating back to January in bodybuilding and repeated regularly throughout the year, 
and dated back to July for pro wrestling and continually referred to, that the company was going to have the most stringent steroid tests in all of sports, no testing has commenced. People honestly shouldn't believe it until they see it, quoted WWF spokesman Steve Planamenta. All I can say is we're going to do it. We're serious about this topic. From what we're told, aside from the speech made by McMahon in Portland, Maine in distribution to the wrestlers of a pamphlet listing the legal ramifications of being caught with various steroids, there has been nothing done by the company from a wrestler's standpoint. WCW attorney Kip Frey said that WCW was investigating possible testing, but didn't set a timetable. Gilbert estimated 75% of today's wrestlers to be on steroids, and said he thought use had cut down a tad because more guys have seen the side effects and because they are harder to obtain. Gilbert said he used steroids specifically because he felt he needed them to increase his earning power. I felt it would enhance my career. That's the way everybody was going and they were the ones the promoters were using. You saw guys who couldn't even lace their boots getting put in main events. The newsletter also contained a chart listing the drugs purchased by Zarian as compared with those distributed to patients through a prescription from September 18, 1988, when doctors dispensing steroids for non-therapeutic reasons was made a felony, until March 21, 1990 when he was busted. Of 8,500 and ever tablets, 330 were used for medical reasons. Of 28,000 methyl testosterone tablets, 230 were prescribed. Of 4,700 cc's of testosterone, 504 were prescribed. Of 13,200 Anadrol and Winstrol V tablets, 140 were prescribed and of 7,000 tablets of testosterone cypionate, 20 were prescribed. In addition, sidominophens and sedatives, the numbers were even more staggering, only 58 of 10,200 tablets of Tylenol-4 were prescribed, 30 of 7,000 tablets of Tylenol-3 and 20 of 7,000 Valiums. The Inside Edition television piece originally scheduled to run on October 18, has been rescheduled for some time in November because of rating sweeps. The story, which includes interviews with Zaurian and Bruno Sammartino, will be on Hulk Hogan and anabolic steroids, and not on pro wrestling or anabolic steroids in general. While in all fairness that seems to make Hogan a scapegoat, in this case he's the one who created his own problem. Attorneys for former pro wrestler superstar Billy Graham on October 28th filed a pre-filing writ of intention to sue Zaharian, the World Wrestling Federation and seven drug companies that manufactured anabolic steroids. The actual basis of the suit hasn't been revealed, although Graham's attorneys had sent a 152-page complaint to McMahon back in August, which resulted in a rebuttal letter by McMahon's attorney Theodore Dismore, and things have been in a holding pattern since that time. So after all that, it's time to head off to Chattanooga, for Halloween Havoc 91, which had the misfortune of going head-to-head with the biggest football game of the year on cable, Giants vs. Redskins on ESPN, and the seventh game of the World Series. While almost all expectations were that this would have a negative effect on the buy rate, WCW sources said they would have been happy just to garner a 1.0 buy rate, they were able to pack the building with 8,900 fans, the house was $45,000, so about half was paid and half was papered which is no accomplishment to be taken lightly going against the seventh game of the most exciting World Series in years. From all accounts, it was a super live show. As a pay-per-view event, it was something less than super. 1. In the Chamber of Horrors, Sting and Al Higante and Rick and Scott Steiner beat Cactus Jack and Abdullah the Butcher and Big Van Vader and Diamond Stud in 1236. They did an angle on television where as Barry Wyndham and Dustin Rhodes were driving to the building, Arnold Anderson and Larry Zbyszko smashed the door of a car on Wyndham's hand to explain his absence for the show, a substitution WCW knew about on Wednesday but never bothered to publicize. Vader subbed for Wyndham and Cactus Jack and Oz also traded places because at least it put Jack in a match that had a chance. Even though the match came off good live with three guys juicing, on TV it was a nightmare. At the beginning of the match, an electric chair came down and we were told the match ended when someone was placed in the chair and one of the teammates flipped the switch and zapped in with volts. Which is all well and good but had nothing whatsoever to do with the advertised stipulations, which were so confusing nobody remembered them to begin with. Between the electric chair, the refer eye camera which only served to make the viewers at home nauseous, the ghouls at ringside, a collection of jobbers in face paint, one of whom was Brian Clark better known as Night Stalker, and the two mask jobbers that came out of a coffin during the match to give Rick Steiner somebody to beat up on, this looked like the brainchild of a television executive on LSD with no knowledge of or respect for pro wrestling trying to make fun of it. And aside from the LSD comment, that's pretty much what happened. Abby, Cactus and Sting all juiced, with Cactus juicing heavy. The on-off lever of the electric chair kept falling into the on position. They wasted a lot of quality talent with this one. Anyway, the finish saw Steiner pull a reversal on Abby, 
hit him in the chair and Cactus pulled the switch and we had an explosion. Abby was then supposed to do a stretcher job to sell the explosion, but of course didn't, and instead beat up the ghouls after the match. Now aren't you sorry that one man gang quit so he could be put in the chair, get amnesia and come back as a babyface reverend? 2 stars. 2. PN News and Big Josh beat the creatures, Johnny Rich and Joey Mags, in 513 when Josh gave Mags and butt drop and News splashed him off the top rope. At least they didn't have them come up wearing humps. This match was a complete waste of valuable time, but the work itself was okay. 1 and 1 quarter stars. 3. Bobby Eaton pinned Terrence Taylor in 1541 with the Alabama Jam. Taylor came out dressed like he just got in from a wedding. The scariest move of the night was Eaton coming off the top rope outside the ring with a knee drop onto the ramp on Taylor. Taylor did his side suplex into a power bomb on the ramp. There was a lot of high risk stuff and the last few minutes were great. 3 and 1 half stars. 4. Johnny B. Bad pinned Jimmy Garvin in 825. You could tell these guys worked overtime putting this match together. Michael Hayes was in the corner with his arm in a sling, even though he wasn't hurt, but they needed to establish Garvin as the face here, since had Garvin come out by himself, Bad may have gotten more cheers, plus they wanted Hayes out of the Van Hammer match because he would have gotten an overwhelming amount of cheers, and somebody somewhere is determined to shove Hammer down our throats, even though nobody will take credit for it. Bad showed a lot of improvement and took great bumps, although he also showed he was green in a lot of ways. Garvin was more inspired than usual. Bad broke his nose doing his sunset flip off the top rope, and what a great move that one is, huh? Finish saw Garvin hit the DDT but Teddy Long distracted the ref who didn't count the pin. Garvin went after Long and Bad hit him with a left hook and got the pin. Hayes decked Long after the match. Two and three quarter stars. Five. Steve Austin went to a 15-minute draw with Dustin Rhodes to keep the TV title. A lot of good moves and counter moves. If there is anyone in the US with the potential to be the next Ric Flair, as a total all-around performer. It's Austin because he's so advanced and has incredible presence and ability for two years in the business. Rhodes isn't too far behind him, either. They did a two-minute side headlock by Austin in the middle. Rhodes juiced at 8.30 after being pounded on outside the ring. Austin also came off the top rope with a double sledge to the floor. Rhodes did a great spin bump off a clothesline. Austin juiced at 13 minutes. Rhodes should have gone for a few more near falls in the last 90 seconds but set it up for one hot move at the end before time ran out. Three and a quarter stars. Six. Bill Kazmaier beat Oz in 358 with the torture rack. These guys could have had the worst match in the history of WCW pay-per-views, but the company didn't allot them enough time. It could have been much worse than it was, but that's still no reason for it being there in the first place. Negative one half star. Seven. Van Hammer pinned Doug Summers in 112 with a slingshot suplex. Hammer only missed three of the five moves he tried. One star. 8. Brian Pillman pinned Richard Morton to become the first WCW light heavyweight champion. Pillman must not have recovered from his injuries, it was his first match back after missing a few weeks with a torn latissimus muscle. This match should have been a fast-paced high-flying signature match to establish the division similar to the great match Pillman had with Brad Armstrong at The Clash but it wasn't at all and was the biggest disappointment on the show. Pillman won with a flying body press off the top rope in 1244. One star. 9. The Halloween Phantom, Rick Rude, pinned Tom Zank in 126 with a neck breaker. It was good to establish Rude in this fashion but anyone who has ever studied logical booking 101 would know that you don't destroy a babyface in this manner on a major show when he's in the main event challenging for the world title at several house shows over the next few weeks. It renders Luger vs. Sank as a negative draw main event, but I guess it's only fair because at least now it's no longer any more or less attractive than Luger vs. Kazmaier. What was done in the match was fine. One star. 10. The enforcers, Arnold Anderson and Larry Zbyszko, kept the WCW tag team titles beating the Patriots, Chip the Firebreaker and Claude Champion, in 951 when Anderson pinned the Chipster with a spinebuster. The Patriots have a lot of negative charisma. Everyone tried but Todd has this knack of never being in the right place at the right time. Enforcers were pretty much the faces here. One and one quarter stars. 11. Lex Luger retained the WCW title winning two of three falls from Ron Simmons. First fall was slow, with Simmons winning in 452 with the spinebuster. Luger sold his back a lot during the second fall. The announcing in this match was great in getting the story across. Luger won the fall via DQ when it looked like they were going to take a double bump over the top rope but Harley Race held onto Simmons and Luger went over and they called for the DQ in 10.07. Third fall saw Luger bleed hard way under the eye. 
Simmons made a big comeback and went for the three-point stance and tackle to Luger, who moved and Simmons hit the post. Luger then pinned him with a pile driver in 359. Can you believe that finish? A heel winning the main event on a pay-per-view clean with his hold. In fact, there were no screw job endings the entire card, and it was booked by Dusty Rhodes. This match was quite a strong argument point for two of three fall matches, because technically it was nothing special, but the three falls gave them a chance to do a storyline that made it a very good match. Three and one half stars. The other highlights were Dangerously's interview where he returned as a manager with Rude, who unmasked and Medusa, and an interview by the Young Pistols where they'll be working as heels in a program for the US tag belts against the Patriots. I'm in the distinct minority here but I gave it a thumbs down. Three real good matches out of 11 and lots of matches that had no business being there doesn't make a great show to me, even with eight guys bleeding, six intentional, two hard way. It was probably better than it sounded on paper because the only match that can be considered a disappointment was Pillman Morton. I guess after hitting rock bottom with the bash, this was a step forward. But watching the show I felt like they were stepping forward, backward, sideways, up down and nowhere all at the same time. Definitely lots of steps and you see positive signs, but you don't see any progress at all. But the announcing was real good, dangerously, Rude and Medusa as a trio have tremendous heel presence. Finishing the show off with Luger Simmons did make painfully obvious that Luger doesn't have the charisma or ring presence to finish a big show off like Flair or Hogan, let alone the ability of Flair but it was a good and different main event which lived up to its hype and exceeded expectations. That Ron Simmons video at Florida State is great even on the 1420th airing. We were also in Sacramento on October 24th with the WWF at Arco Arena before a crowd of 5,000, about 4,000 paid. 1. British Bulldog pinned Colonel Mustafa with a sunset flip in 1145. Bulldog mainly led cheers. Fans were chanting USA, USA during this match. Well, the USA used to be a part of the United Kingdom, but that ended around 1776. Anyway, I asked a six-year-old behind me why he was chanting USA, USA, believe me. Anything was more entertaining than watching this match. He said, I don't know. Later he figured out and told me, I'm for the American, aren't you? I told him I'd make him a deal. If he can find an American, I'd be for him also. Finally he gave up finding me one and said he was chanting it because I want two. This was brutally horrible. Little did we know it was only the beginning. Negative one and three quarter stars. Two. The Mountie beat Bret Hart via count out in 1328 so Bret kept the Intercontinental title. Nothing happened at all during this match. They were on the floor and Mountie held Bret for Jimmy Hart to hit him with the megaphone but Bret moved and Mountie got the shot. But Mountie got the zapper and zapped Bret and he was about to hit Jimmy Hart and got back in the ring to beat the count. One quarter star. Three. Greg Human Intermission Ballantyne beat Hercules in 1251 with the figure 4 leg lock. Words can't describe this other than it being the single worst match I've seen this year. The highlight was Valentine doing three straight dusty clotheslines. The low light was the rest of it. 4 stars. 4. Legion of Doom beat Natural Disasters via DQ in 813 to keep the WWF tag team titles. Even though he's next to useless in the ring the useless he's next to is Typhoon, Earthquake has got to be one of the biggest and baddest dudes on this planet. Horrible match. The disasters are aptly named. This match is worth seeing live if only to see the incredible size difference when the small team is little guys like the load. The only good thing was the guys ribbing ref Earl Heckner in continually threatening to take him out and him having to sprint out of the way of charging muscle monsters and lard monsters. Finish saw Typhoon splash animal and Quake give him the Quake. They then threw Earl the Pearl out of the ring for the DQ. After the match Hawk gave both guys a double clothesline off the top rope. One half star, it would have been negative stars on any normal card with any normal promotion, but at this point you have to start grading on a curve. Speaking of grading on a curve, next came intermission, which is a dud on most shows, but on this show was about two and a half stars. 5. The Berserker pinned Jim Neidhart in 731 with his feet on the ropes. I hope Neidhart is making good money having to run around dressed like little Lord Fauntleroy on a steroid and beer diet. Bad timing throughout, but they still outshined everyone on the show thus far. 3 quarter star. 6. Big Boss Man pinned IRS in 811. By this point, these two were like watching Tiger Mask against Dynamite Kid in their primes. A solid match that in spots was really good. Boss Man really puts out a lot of effort and moves great for a guy his size. IRS got the pin with his feet on the ropes, but the ref saw it and disallowed it. As IRS argued with the ref, Boss Man schoolboyed him. IRS hit Boss Man with his briefcase after the match, two and one quarter stars. Seven. 
Flair pinned Roddy Piper in 1136 with his feet on the ropes. Finish wouldn't have been so bad if it wasn't the third straight match with the same finish. Lots of heat. Flair was his usual. Piper has great ring presence and psychology but his wrestling was pretty rusty. They did a ref bump and the second ref blew his cue and did a run-in to count the fall before Flair hit Piper with the chair, which the second ref wasn't supposed to see, so he had to run out then realize he blew it and run back to the dressing room, then run back out again. The chair shot was the only thing weak about the match. Piper kicked out. Finally he was pinned with the same finish they're doing everywhere. Three stars. The next show was announced for December 8th with Cato vs. El Matador whose name was Booed the Bully vs. Bulldog, Nasty Boys vs. Rockers, Undertaker vs. Duggan, both men cheered, Hart vs. Mounty, which got no reaction at all, and Roberts vs. Justice, which got a solid reaction. Of course Justice won't be there, and they knew it, and they announced him anyway, but that's already been covered. Moving to the Oakland Coliseum Arena on October 25th, well, after the previous night, this was an enjoyable night of wrestling. 1. Hercules pinned Neidhart in 10 minutes when Neidhart went for a power slam but Hercules reversed it and held the tights. Mainly mistimed moves and wrist holds, but Hercules expanded 400% more effort than the previous night. Dud. 2. IRS pinned Bossman after hitting him with a briefcase in 925. Bossman really worked hard again and IRS didn't slow the match down like the previous night. This is an entertaining match. IRS hit him after the match with a briefcase as well. 2 and 3 quarter stars. 3. Bulldog pinned Mustafa with a roll-up in 957. They must have realized they were working on the same card as the historic first meeting of Flair vs. Hogan, so they upped that work rate as well. 1 half star. 4. Hogan beat Flair via DQ in 1135, see page 1, 3 and 1 half stars. 5. Berserker pinned Valentine in 1055 with a schoolboy. Valentine appeared comatose here but Berserker tried. One half star. Six. Hart pinned Mounty to keep the title in 1124. Jimmy Hart held Brett. Mounty charged at him, Brett moved, Mounty hit Jimmy and Brett schoolboyed him. Mounty worked the match without his shirt and proved conclusively that he's not on steroids. One star. Seven. Load beat disasters via DQ in 901 with the same finish as the previous night. It was also a better match than the previous night. One star. Only announcements made about the next show November 15 Cow Palace, where appearing would be Matador and Kerry Von Erich, both named Booth Virgil vs. Ted DiBiase, both given equal cheers and boos, and Hogan vs. Flair, mild reaction. Contest results Mark Bennett of Jackson, Michigan was the winner of our Pick the Gate contest for the first two nights of the Ric Flair vs. Hulk Hogan series of matches. Bennett picked $151,252 for the Oakland Coliseum Arena and $177,577 for the Los Angeles Sports Arena, coming the closest of 319 entrants. Bennett wins a one-year subscription extension to the Observer and a surprise gift, the program from the card at the Oakland Coliseum Arena. Finishing second was Michael Carlson of London, England, who happens to be a vice president of Major League Baseball, the only vice president from any sport, entertainment, sports entertainment, record company, or insurance company to crack the top 25. Carlson, who picked the Oakland Gate at $156,000 and Los Angeles Gate at $188,000, wins a six-month subscription to The Observer. Sean Raggedio of Vallejo, California came the closest to picking the gate for the Oakland show, predicting $157,500, or just $342 less than the actual gate. Of all people I came the closest to picking the gate in Los Angeles, picking $178,000, or $740 less than the actual gate. Top 25 finishers, 1. Mark Bennett, Jackson, Michigan, 2. Michael Carlson, London, England, 3. Louis Bordeaux, Hillsborough, New Hampshire, 4. Bob Ivey, Starkville, Mississippi, 5. Jim Russell, Orlando, Florida, 6. Nicholas Babo, Salanti, Michigan, 7. John Brooks, House Springs, Missouri, 8. Joseph Stein, Chictawaga, New York, 9. Janice Long, Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, 10. Gary Rhodes, Manassas, Virginia, 11. Dave Meltzer, Campbell, California, 12. Greg Manning, Staten Island, New York, 13. Gary Langevin, Newport, Vermont, 14. Charlie Matos, Nashville, Tennessee, 15. Jimmy Manzella, Yonkers, New York, 16. Dave Shearer, Marmara, New Jersey, 17. Arash Hameyan, Potomac, Maryland, 18. Francesco Castaño, Gaithersburg, Maryland, 19. Eric Feeble, Ringe, New Hampshire, 20. 
Sean Raggedio Vallejo, California, 21. Tim Whitehead, Johnson City, Tennessee, 22. Dave Katz, Mount Holly, New Jersey, 23. Greg Petrosino, Bel Air, Maryland, 24. Marlon Newman, Galloway, Ohio, 25. Randy Lance, Mount Clemens, Michigan. Thanks to everyone who entered this first ever of its kind contest. Because of the interest level we'll definitely be doing it again. This is the second issue of the current four-issue set of observers. If you've got A1 on your address label, it means your observer subscription will expire in two more weeks. Renewal rates remain $6 for four issues, $12 for eight, $24 for 16, $36 for 24, $48 for 32 up through $60 for 40 issues within the United States and Canada. Overseas rates for weekly airmail delivery is $9 for each set of four issues up through $90 for 40 issues. Copies of the 110-page Observer Yearbook are available for $12 in the U.S. and Canada and $18 overseas. Addresses for all subscriptions, letters to the editor, match results, news items and any other correspondence is the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, P.O. Box 1228, Campbell, California 95009122. Fax messages can be sent to the Observer Afternoon Eastern Time Daily, 9 a.m. Pacific Time, at 408-378-6562. UWA. October 20th at El Torreo in Naucalpan Saviano 4 beat Canadian Tiger in a mask versus masked match revealing him as Mike Lozanski from Calgary. Also Mil Mascaras and Dos Cars beat Kinect and Fishman via DQ when Kinect unmasked Mascaras in the third fall to set up a singles meeting between the two biggest heavyweight legends of Mexico of the past 20 years which took place on October 27th. Also Pegasus Kid, Chris Benoit and Killer and Buffalo Allen beat Viano 3, and Enrique Vera and Gran Hamada in two straight falls with Kid pinning Viano in both falls with both Kid and Viano bleeding a ton, Black Power and El Signo and Negro Navarro beat Viano 1 and 5 and El Sicotolico, Black Terry and Jose Luis Feliciano beat Blackman 2 and Samurai, Osamu Matsuda and Rambo and El Engendro and the England beat Fantasma and Valente Fernandez and Super Pinocchio. October 21st in Puebla was headlined by Mascaras and Dos Caras and Viano 3 vs. Connect and Fishman and Pegasus Kid. October 25th in Tijuana was headlined by the Mercenaries, Billy Anderson and Tim Patterson and Luis Piccoli, vs. Eddie and Chavo and Mondo Guerrero plus Mascaras vs. Scorpio. Carlos Chavez, who has been out of action since a 1988 auto accident, returns in November. He had famous feuds years back with Abdullah Tamba and Fishman in El Torreo, there are 2,500 licensed pro wrestlers in Mexico and 260 arenas that run house shows on a regular basis. Canadian vampire Casanova, one of the most over baby faces for MLL, worked here on October 19th in a Patlaco teaming with Viano 3 to beat Kanek and Dos Caras via DQ when Kanek gave 3 a low blow. Caras then got mad at his partner and challenged him to a singles match. October 9th in Mexico City saw Cars and Black Magic and Mascaras beat Kinect and Babyface and Pero Agueo via DQ with Kinect pulling off Cars' mask. On October 12th in Apatlaco, Mascaras and Kinect formed a tag team to beat Giant Warrior and Miguelito Perez via DQ. October 12th in San Pedro Octopon had Mascaras and Vera beat Kinect and Fishman via DQ and Los Villanos beat Death Missionaries. Power and Signo and Navarro, plus the MLL midgets worked the show. EMLL October 20th at Arena Mexico in Mexico City saw Conan and L.E.O. Del Santo and Canadian Vampire Casanova beat Los Brazos in two of three falls. Emilio Charles Jr. is scheduled to tour Japan for SWS in November. October 18th in Tijuana saw MLL run with Lismark and L.E.O. de Lismark and Atlantis vs. Los Brazos and Conan and Rey Mysterio and Bobby Bradley vs. Mercenaries, Anderson and Patterson, and Weichel. Mongolian Mahler is working on getting his visa problems taken care of and returning. October 15th at Arena Mexico saw Cien Caras and Mascara Año 2000 and Sangre Chicana beat Rio de Jalisco Jr. and Casanova and Aguayo Octagon and Moger and Santa beat Masacre and MS1 and Satanico. Midgets Mascara de Sabrata and Octagon Chido and Aguilita Solitaria beat Pequeno Cobarde and Piratita Morgan and Espectrito. Kyoko Inoue and Tashio Yamada beat Esther and Cynthia Moreno and Dandy and Anibal and Kato Kung Lee beat Fuerza Guerrera and Universo 2000 and Kung Fu. Then ran two angles during the Octagon match. As the ultimate dragon Yoshihiro Asai came to the ring and Asakure grabbed a green liquid and went to throw it in Dragon's eyes. But he kicked Masakure's hand and the liquid went in Masakure's own eyes. Masakure was blinded and started swinging wildly and hit both his partners who then reacted and beat on him and left him to get pinned for the first fall. 
After the match Satanico and MS1 offered Parata Morgan a spot as the third member of the Infernalis tag team. They are building toward CN Cars defending his CMLL World Heavyweight title against Jalisco. October 19th in Acapulco SW Atlantis keep the NWA middleweight title beating Blue Panther in two out of three falls in what was said to have been a super match. October 20th in San Pedro Octopon saw Octagon and Santo and Viano 3 beat Brazos. All Japan. The October 24th climax of the tour drew 4,900 fans to the Yokohama Bunka Gym to see Jumbo Tsurita retain his Triple Crown title beating Toshiaki Kawada in 1905 with a back suplex. In other matches, Stan Hansen and Danny Spivey beat Johnny Ace and Kenna Kobashi in 1637 when Hansen pinned Ace with a lariat, Masafuchi beat Dan Crawford to retain the PWF Junior Heavyweight title in 2140 when the referee stopped the match as Crawford was caught in an unbreakable submission hold, Doug Furness and the British Bulldogs beat Firecat, Brady Boone and Joel Deaton and Billy Black when Dynamite Kid pinned Black, Giant Baba and Rusher Kimura and Tsuyashi Kikuchi beat Akira Tao and Motoshi Okuma and Haruka Aigen, Joe and Dean Malenko beat Mighty Inoue and Asamo Taranishi, and Richard Slinger and Robert Gibson beat Yoshinari Ogawa and Mitsuo Momoda. During the card, Kobashi grabbed the ring mic and demanded that he and Kikuchi be added to the tag team tournament, which at least makes for a lot of exciting matches even though the end result of those matches is obvious. October 22nd in Tamasu drew 1,600 as Surita and Tao and Fuchi beat Hansen and Spivey and Deaton in 1338 when Surita back suplexed Deaton. Kobashi and Kawada beat Gibson and Black, Bulldogs beat Crawford and Furnace in a non-title match, Malenkos beat Ace and Cat and Kikuchi pinned Slinger. October 23rd in Maibashi drew 3,850 as Kikuchi and Kobashi and Kawada beat Surita and Tao and Ogawa in 2033 when Kawada beat Ogawa with the sleeper. Anson and Spivey beat Ace and Black, Bulldogs beat Cat and Gibson, Furnace and Crawford beat Deaton and Slinger, Malenkos beat Inoue and Taranishi and Baba and Kimura and Momota beat Okuma and Aigen and Fuchi. Next tour is the Tag Team Tournament which beings November 16. Mitsuharu Masawa missed the final week of the tour because of his broken nose. TV on October 20th drew a 3.7 video and 4.3 Nielsen rating. This past weekend's television show had Hansen and Spivey vs. Malenkos and Surita and Tao and Fuchi vs. Kikuchi and Kobashi and Kawada. Other Japan Notes Bison Kimura won the All-Pacific Women's title on October 26th in Toyama beating Suzuka Minami. SWS announced that Genichiro Tenryu would have singles matches on November 8 against Terry Von Erich and November 10 against Ashura Hara. Besides the Trevor Burbick vs. Takata match on December 22nd at Sumo Hall, they will also have a match with Billy Scott, who gets rave reviews, against a champion kickboxer from the United States. The Sheik and his nephew, who worked as Sabu in Memphis, will form a tag team for FMW's tag team tournament. Atsushi Onita and Tarzan Goda will team and probably win the thing, also Samba Asako and Riki Fuji and Gregory Varichev will team with a new Soviet guy who was the 1989 World Heavyweight Champion in Judo. Also debuting in Japan will be the Mercenaries, Billy Anderson and Louis Spicoli. PWF has a show December 3rd in Hamamatsu with Minoru Suzuki vs. Yoshiaki Fujiwara, Masakatsu Funaki vs. Dwayne Kozlowski, Wayne Shamrock vs. Takahashi, Bart Vale vs. Tomatake and Jerry Flynn vs. Wellington Wilkins Jr. Saw the photos of the October 18th match with Jushin Liger vs. Chris Benoit. Liger did the Asai moonsault off the top rope to the floor. Another new move was with Benoit standing on the middle rope, Liger ran across the ring and leapt up with a Frankensteiner type roll up, and got the three count. FMW on October 24th in Yoshikawa drew a sellout 2,458 as Onida and Goto beat Fuji and Asako Lance Storm and Chris Jericho beat Horace Boulder and the Gladiator. Wing opened its tour on October 25th at Tokyo's Karakuen Hall before 1,200 with a singles tournament round robin headlining. Mr. Pogo beat three straight guys while several Lucha Libre wrestlers are in from UWA. All Japan Women October 25th in Fukui saw Suzuki Manami beat Takako Inoue and Bat Yoshinaga and Akira Hokuto and Bull Nakano beat Kaoru Ito and Miori Kamiya and Kimura. October 22nd FMW Anita drew 2,583 as Gladiator and Boulder and Mark Starr beat Onita and Fuji and Shooter, Goto and Handa beat Storm and Jericho and Amigo Ultra beat Pandita. Akira Maeda is now in the Soviet Union wanting to start a Rings USSR promotion with champion Samba wrestlers and judokas. All Japan women on October 23rd in Takoka drew 1,400 as Hokuto beat Takako Inoue and Nakano and Yoshinaga beat Manami Toyota and Atsuko Mita. JWP on October 23rd in Sapporo drew 2,350 as Dynamite Kaisei beat Harley Saito with an armlock submission, T. 
Terry Power and Reggie Bennett beat Devil Masami and Kyuri Suzuki and Atsuki Yamazaki beat Mayumi Ozaki. All Japan women on October 24th in Suriga drew 1,890 as Toyota beat Kimura and Yoshinaga and Hokuto and Nakano beat Debbie Malenko and Yumu Kohata and Minami. FMW on October 23rd in Iberigi drew 1,328 as Gladiator and Boulder beat Onita and a rookie named Gyanosuke, Dodo and Fuji and Shooter beat Storm and Jericho and Star, and Ultra beat Pandita. DWP on October 22nd in Hotel drew 1,675 as Kaisei and Hoshino formerly Scorpion, beat Plum Marco and Devil Masami, Bennett and Power beat Miki Handa and Saito and Suzuki and Yamazaki beat Eagle Soai and Ozaki. All Japan women drew 1,300 on October 22nd in Nagano as Kimura beat Toyota via submission with the STF, Yoshinaga and Nakano and Hokuto beat Mima Shimoda and Minami and Malenko. October 21st All Japan women in Matsumoto drew 1,800 as Hata beat Yoshinaga and Nakano and Hokuto beat Kimura and Ito. New Japan TV shows draw big ratings when shown in syndication with October 5th doing a 7.5 in syndication, and October 12th doing a 7.1. All Japan Women on October 21st drew a 3.1 rating for its Sao headline by Asia Kong and Bison Kimura vs. Kyoko Inoue and Tashio Yamada. Japan TV Rundown October 5th New Japan, 1. Shinya Hashimoto beat Tony Halme in 1.15 of Round 4 of a Wrestler vs. Boxer match. Halme has gained a lot of weight around the middle, but he's huge. Match wasn't very exciting but it looked realistic. Hashimoto was knocked down three times in the third round. He did an awesome leg trip shoot move in the fourth round, tried for a submission with a hammerlock, then did a few stiff kicks, a DDT and got the submission with a short arm scissors. One star, two. Great Muda pinned Tatsumi Fujinami in a non-title match in 1601. This match had the greatest ring entrances I've ever seen, complete with guys being shot out of a cannon. The crowd heat wasn't there but the work was solid throughout. Fujinami juiced. Finish was totally American and the crowd hated it. Muda blew mist in the ref's eyes when Fujinami ducked. Fujinami did two back suplexes and a German suplex but no ref to count the fall. Muda then did a low blow, hit Fujinami with a beer bottle and pinned him with a moonsault when the ref got back up. Two and a half stars. October 6th, All Japan, 1. Prophet and Furnace beat Deaton and Black to keep the Asian tag team titles. Finish was really exciting as Furnace kicked out of Black's moonsault twice. Deaton made the save when Furnace hit the Frankensteiner on Black. Finally Crawford pinned Black with a double arm suplex into a power bomb in 16 minutes. 3 and 1 half stars, 2. Kawada and Kikuchi beat Surita and Ogawa in 1534. Match started slower than these guys usually do. Major emphasis put on Surita vs Kawada to build up their singles match. They traded a lot of sleepers and face locks which aren't as over since this wasn't taped in Tokyo with all the hardcore fans who get into the submissions. It turned into a good match with a lot of hot moves and near falls and the crowd was on its feet by the end when Kawada pinned Ogawa with a power bomb. Three and one half stars, three. Terry Gordy and Steve Williams beat Misawa and Kobashi in 1825. Started slow but very stiff and with good heat. Kobashi missed a moonsault on Gordy and was pinned with a power bomb. Three and one half stars. October 6th, SWS, 1. Samson Fuyuki and Shinichi Nakano beat Kendo Nagasaki and Kabuki in 14 minutes, when Fuyuki pinned Kabuki with a crucifix. No heat but some of the match was good and everyone was trying so it wasn't that bad. 1 and 1 quarter stars, 2. Kenichi Oya pinned Akira Katayama as part of the WWF Junior Heavyweight Tournament in 1445. Pretty sloppy early and then they went to the mat and did basic holds which got no heat. They started doing spots which got some heat going back and forth with near falls. Katayama did a dive through the ropes to the floor, then came off the top rope to the floor with a flying spear. Katayama missed a spear in the ring and was pinned with a back suplex. One and one half star, three. Tatsumi Kitahara pinned Misa Orihara in 1455 in the junior heavyweight tournament. Orihara did the Liger dive over the top with a flip and then the Asai moonsault to the floor in the first minute of the match. Then they went to the mat and traded submissions. Kitahara suplexed Orihara over the top rope to the floor, then they went on the floor and Kitahara gave Orihara one of those dynamite kid fast suplexes on the floor. Orihara definitely has guts. Orihara then did his own moonsault off the top rope to the floor. The crowd was so padded with non-wrestling fans that they didn't even react to that move. Kitahara won with a DDT and a bridging double arm suplex. Two and three quarter stars, four. Greg Valentine pinned Fumihiro Niikura with an elbow drop in 851. Worse than terrible. Negative one half star, five. 
Davy Boy Smith pinned Takashi Ishikawa in 10-01 with a flying clothesline off the top rope. Ishikawa worked hard to carry it to a bad match. Smith just wouldn't do anything. 1 star, 6. Naoki Sano and George Takano beat the natural powers, Haku and Yoshiaki Yatsu, via DQ in 1301 and Haku threw the ref on the floor. They gave Sano a stuffed power bomb, then Takano, and when Shunji Takano did the run-in, they gave him one as well. Everyone tried hard but the match was sluggish. Sano sure respected Haku because you didn't see his usual stiff kicks to the face here. Two and one quarter stars, seven. Tenryu and Hara beat Demolition when Hara pinned Smash with a clothesline. A terrible main event match. Three quarter star. October 13th, All Japan, 1. Gordian Williams beat Deaton and Black in 1602. Gordian Williams controlled the match but they all worked nice spots at the end with near falls. Finally Williams pinned Black with a fisherman suplex. Two and a half stars, 2. Misawa and Kawada and Kikuchi beat Surita and Tao and Ogawa in 2448. They did a lot of submissions early. Misawa missed a dive over the top rope and crashed onto the floor. Tao gave him a short clothesline on the floor. Then they went to all the hot moves and near falls until Misawa pinned Tao with a double arm suplex into a power bomb. Three and one half stars. USWA. October 21st in Memphis at the Mid South Coliseum drew 900 fans as Tony Anthony beat Tony Falk. Dub Masters pinned Brian Christopher. Bill Dundee and Dutch Mantel beat the Texas Outlaws in a hair versus mask match, revealing them to be Jeff Sword and Doug Vines, and that meant Sword and Vines, who lost Loser Leaves Town matches about two months back, were suspended for life. Jerry Lawler beat Billy Travis via count out when he threw fire in Travis' eyes, and the finale saw Jeff Jarrett and Robert Fuller and Eddie Marlin beat Eric Embry and Tom Pritchard and Tony Falk when Jarrett pinned Pritchard, and after the match, Embry and Pritchard had their breakup with Pritchard going face. October 22nd in Louisville saw Anthony Drew with Masters, Falk beat Steve Marino, Outlaws beat Dundee and Mantel when Embry hit Mantel with a chain, Lawler beat Travis and in a handcuff match, Embry and Pritchard DDQ Jarrett and Fuller. At television on October 26th, Jarrett and Fuller had a squash match when Masters ran in with new tag team partner Bart Sawyer and Sawyer jumped off the top rope on Jarrett's arm. Travis came out, selling the fire that Lawler threw at him last week and said he was bringing people in to get Lawler. He brought out a muscular black guy who was never identified but it was strongly hinted that it was the snowman, who actually held the USWA title and then quit the promotion and took the title belt, and never did the job on the way out. The masked guy attacked Lawler. Lawler said he hoped it was snowman because he's been waiting a long time to get it back at him. Pritchard did an interview where he said that he started doing interviews like he does before Roddy Piper, which isn't the case, but whatever. October 28th in Memphis had Mantel vs. Anthony with a winner to get a title shot at Embry's Southern title, Dundee vs. Dog of War, Marlin vs. Falk, Jarrett and Fuller vs. Sawyer and Masters for the USWA tag team titles, Lawler vs. The Masked Man managed by Travis and Embry vs. Pritchard. Global. October 25th at the Dallas Sportatorium drew 1,200 fans for three hours of television taping. In matches taped for Supercard to air November 18 on ESPN saw Sam Houston beat Sean Summer, The Wild Bunch, Black Bart and Rattlesnake, and Bill Irwin, beat Barry Horowitz and Alex Porto and Eddie Robinson, Lightning Kid pinned Todd Overbo, Patriot beat Sweet Daddy Falcone via DQ and Skander Akbar interfered and Steve Simpson and, and Chris Walker kept the global tag team titles beating the California Connection, Rod Price and John Tatum, when Simpson pinned Tatum with Patriot getting involved in the finish punching Tatum, and also Akbar. For syndication on November 16 and November 19 on ESPN, Bull Payne beat Terry Daniels, the Renegade Warriors beat Tony George and Buster Blackheart, the Coast to Coast Connection, Price, Tatum and Falcone, beat Larry Green and Overbo and Manny Villalobos, Gary Young beat Tug Taylor via DQ and Taylor hip tossed ref Rick Manning, Lightning Kid kept his GWF light heavyweight title beating Ben Jordan and Jeff Gaylord beat Mike Stetson. For ESPN on November 25 saw Chaz and Terry Garvin beat the Davis brothers via DQ and Mike threw Garvin over the top rope. Lightning Kid came to ringside with a roll of tape and they taped Garvin's legs and wrists around the bottom rope. Then all three kept working on Chaz. Tug Taylor who is Chaz's real-life father then ran in. The heels held down Chaz and Taylor climbed the top rope, but instead he turned face and leveled both Davis brothers, beat up Lightning Kid and carried Chaz to the dressing room as the crowd was stunned. Also Patriot beat Tony George, Walker and Simpson beat Horowitz and Summer, Kid pinned Steve Tana and Tatum and Price and Falcone went to a 10-minute draw with Rattlesnake and Irwin and Bart. The original plan was to have Max Andrews be represented at ringside by Slick. However, as it turns out Slick wasn't technically fired by the WWF, 
he's just not being used by the WWF so he's free to work with Global but they won't let him work any television, so he's not going to be working. November 1 at the Sportatorium has a 10-man battle royal with the winner to get a shot at Eddie Gilbert's TV title, Scotty Anthony vs. Irwin, Jerry Lynn vs. Ninja, Mike Davis vs. Daniels, Gilbert vs. Houston, Kid vs. Handsome Stranger for the light heavyweight title, Mahlers vs. Houston and Bart and others. October 25th in Gadsden, Alabama saw Brian Lee beat Tom Davis, Mario Santana beat Million Dollar Baby, Bambi beat Susan Sexton, Mahlers beat Rick and Sheik Donovan, Kid Pinchaz and Patriot beat Axis the Demolisher, Lil Edie, by a DQ when Kid interfered. Here and there. Bob Orton wants the word out that despite what Herb Abrams is claiming, he's not under an exclusive contract to Abrams. October 18th in Hamilton, Bermuda saw David Isley beat Thunderfoot No. 2, Gene Ligon, Little Tokyo beat Karate Kid, Osley and Kid beat Foot in Tokyo and Junkyard Dog beat Ivan Koloff. October 19th in the same building saw Foot beat Isley, Kid beat Tokyo, Dog beat Koloff in a chain match and Isley and Dog and Kid beat Koloff and Tokyo and Foot. Pat Tanaka has opened the Tanaka Wrestling School in Tampa at the old Tampa Sportatorium. For more info you can write to Tanaka Wrestling School 106 and Albany, Tampa, Florida 33606. October 25th in Yabucan, Puerto Rico saw El Profe draw with Sweet Brown Sugar, Skip Young, TNT beat Jack Hammer, Galan Mendoza and Randy Rhodes beat Ricky Santana and Ray Gonzalez, Carlitos Colon beat Fidel Sierra, Cuban assassin in WCW, in a cage match, Giant Warrior beat Dick Murdoch, Heartbreakers, Wendell Cooley and Frankie Lancaster, beat Invader No. 1 and Bronco No. 1 via DQ and Miguelito Perez beat Hurricane Castillo Jr. via DQ. October 26th in Cagua saw Sugar and Super Medico No. 3 beat Profe and Goliath, Warrior beat Hammer, Mendoza and Rhodes double count out with Santana and Gonzalez, Colin pinned Murdoch, TNT beat Sierra to win the TV title, Perez beat Castillo via DQ, Heartbreakers DDQ Invader No. 1 and Bronco No. 1. October 27th in Arcebo saw Sugar beat Hammer, Mendoza and Rhodes beat Gonzalez and Santana, Invader No. 1 beat Castillo via DQ, Murdoch beat Warrior, Sierra beat Medico No. 3, Heartbreakers drew TNT and Perez. Joel Goodhart ran a show on October 26th in Pine Hill, New Jersey with Buddy Landell beating J.T. Smith to win the TWA title Eddie Gilbert DDQ Kevin Sullivan. Steve Williams beat Bam Bam Bigelow via DQ when Buddy ripped off the shirt of special referee Buddy Rogers. The Black Hearts beat Jimmy Gennetti and Rockin' Rebel to keep the TWA tag team titles and Pitbull Rex beat Johnny Hotbody in a match where the loser had to eat dog food. Rogers, at the age of 72, will wrestle Landell on Goodhart's show in January in Philadelphia for the TWA title. An Indy on October 26th in Wallingford, Connecticut saw Paul Orndorff beat Dino Bravo via countout plus also appearing were DC Drake, Brian Blair, Sonny Blaze, Tasmaniac, and Larry Winters. EQ on October 26th in Howell, New Jersey had a show that included Tito Santana, Coco Weir, Tasmaniac, Chris Candido, Joe Savoldi, Tyree Pride, and Ray Odyssey. October 25th in Laconia, New Hampshire saw Kevin Sullivan double countout where plus the rest of the same crew. Former newsletter editor BT Express beat J.D. McKay on October 26th in Waynesboro, Tennessee before 100 fans on a show with Chris Champion, Ben Jordan, Candy Devine, Gary Scott, Sheik, George Weingaroff, and J.T. Southern. Suncoast Pro Wrestling drew 375 fans on October 26th at the Manatee Civic Center in Palmetto, Florida with the top matches having Tommy Rogers beat Jerry Flynn to keep the Southern title, Jumbo Barretta beat Masked Superstar to keep the Florida title, and Charlie Fields and Giant Outlaw won the Suncoast Tag Team titles from Vern Henderson and Gator Gilmore. Former pro wrestler Don Curtis of Mark Lewin and Don Curtis fame was named manager of Metropolitan Park in Jacksonville. Curtis, 64, was a big draw in the late 50s in Madison Square Garden. An interesting story about Curtis involves Luthes. Curtis, then going by his real name of Don Beatelman, was a national caliber amateur collegiate heavyweight wrestler in the early 50s at the time Thez was NWA champion. The coach at his college invited Thez to work out with Biatelman, but it was a double cross as there were thousands of people in a packed gym when Thez showed up. Biatelman took Thez down and was riding him while Thez's manager, Strangler Lewis, was getting in the way of newspaper photographers because he didn't want a photo going across the wires of the NWA world champion getting ridden by a college wrestler. Anyway, Thez managed by use some kind of submission hold on Biatelman, which of course was something he was never taught in college wrestling and everyone cried foul at the time. Western States Wrestling Association on November 9 at the San Bernardino Arena has Dr. Dream and Scott Cole vs. Black Ninja and Black Nightmare as the headline match. A group called World Wrestling Superstars is doing indie shows in Vienna, Austria with Kamala, 
Nikolai Volkov, South Dakota, Jones the Mortician, Carmen Desperito, Mike Sharp, Chris Duffy, Cheetah Kid, Ted Petty, Tony Atlas, Klaus Wallace, a former Olympic medalist in judo, and women Heidi Lee Morgan, Rusty Thomas, Peggy Lee Leather, and Bambi. There will be wrestling conventions featuring Rick Rude, Coco Ware, and Junkyard Dog on November 9 at St. Peter's High School in Staten Island, New York, November 10 at Our Lady of Miracles Center in Canarsie in Brooklyn, November 15 at Our Lady of Guadalupe Gym in Brooklyn, November 16, and the Inwood Fire Department Hall in Inwood on Long Island and November 23 at the Jazzercise Club in Deer Park, Long Island. Virginia Wrestling Association on October 19 in Amelia, Virginia included Dragon Master and Leatherface who had worked in Memphis, Jim Cornette doing a Louisville Slugger and Jeff Collett pinning Wahoo McDaniel in the main event after hitting him with Cornette's tennis racket. Upcoming shows are November 15 in Staunton, Virginia with Cream Team vs. Stan Lane and, and Jim Cornette and November 16 in Fredericksburg, Virginia with Cream Team vs. Thunderfeet. EQ starts on Sports Channel America after Thanksgiving on Monday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Kevin Von Erich promoted a show on October 26 in Louisville, Texas, with himself on top defending the world-class title, and the show drew only 50 fans. WWF At the TV tapings in Fort Wayne, the Cobra did bite Randy Savage in the arm and he juiced from the arm which should make a horrifying television angle. El Matador will be replacing the Dragon in the post-Survivor series program with Ted DiBiase. They were a lot more successful on October 22 in Fort Wayne, Indiana with Sergeant Slaughter. They set it up with both nasty boys doing a two-on-one on Jim Duggan and Slaughter coming out to make the save. They may put Duggan and Slaughter together as a team, but it's not definite. Expect Chris Chavez to be brought in as a regular at some point in the near future. Bret Hart and Undertaker had a match taped for Coliseum Video in Dayton on Tuesday. It was said to have been a great match. Conan is expected to have a tryout with his robot suit possibly at the next television taping. Pat Tanaka is gone for now in an amicable split. They decided to drop the Orient Express as a tag team. At the same time, Tanaka wanted time off and gave notice since they didn't have a spot to really use him. October 24th in Tucson drew 1,900 as Skinner beat Brooklyn Brawler, Bushwhackers beat Beverly Brothers, Undertaker pinned Duggan, Nasty Boys beat Rockers, Rockers argued with each other after the match, DBSE beat Virgil via countout and Kerry Von Erich, subbing for justice, pinned Jake Roberts. October 23rd in Beaumont, Texas saw Von Erich pinned Big Bully Bizich, Beverly Brothers beat Bushwhackers, Skinner pinned Brawler, Undertaker pinned Duggan, Nasty Boys beat Rockers, DBSE beat Virgil via Countout and Roberts beat Savage via DQ. October 27th in Montreal saw Skinner beat Brawler, Dino Bravo pinned Jacques Roju, Undertaker pinned Duggan, Beverly Brothers beat Bushwhackers, Savage beat Roberts via DQ, Shawn Michaels beat Jerry Sags and Virgil pinned DBSE. All American Wrestling did a 2.4 rating on October 20th while Prime Time did a 2.2 on October 21st. Ric Flair won't be working the December 12th show at the Tokyo Dome. Playgirl Magazine has a photo spread in its December issue on WWF wrestlers, nothing more than wrestling shots of Tito Santana, Hulk Hogan, Kerry Von Erich and a few others. October 26th in Dallas at Reunion Arena drew 1,800 a Skinner pin brawler, Nasty Boys beat Rockers, DBSE beat Virgil via Countout, Roberts beat Savage via DQ in a four-minute main event, Undertaker pinned Duggan, best match on show, Von Erich pinned Bizich and Bushwhackers beat Beverly Brothers. Show was said to be pretty bad, compared very unfavorably with the Pettuccino show the night before at the Sportatorium. October 27th in Tempe, Arizona drew 5,600 as Bulldog pinned Mustafa Dud, Bret Hart pinned Berserker 1-star, Neidhart pinned Tim Patterson Dud, Flair beat Hogan via countout 2.5 stars, Von Erich pinned Hercules Dud, IRS beat Bossman using the briefcase 2 and a half stars, and Legion of Doom beat Natural Disasters via DQ 1 star. Savage appeared on CBS World Series pregame show on Tuesday, after WCW got a lot of national newspaper press with Jim Hurd inviting Kent Herbick for a tryout, WCW attempted to get Dusty Rhodes on the pregame show however Tim McCarver is friends with Savage and he got on the show instead. Bret Hart is running a weekly pro wrestling column in the Calgary Sun newspaper, October 26th in Los Angeles drew 12,400 paid as Neidhart pinned Hercules in 949 dud, IRS pinned Bossman in 847 using the briefcase 1 and 1 half star, Bulldog pinned Mustafa in 904 dud, Hogan beat Flair via DQ in 1329 3 stars, Mountie beat Hart via countout in 1341 1 star, Berserker pinned Valentine with a small package in 1544 3 and 1 half stars and Load beat Disasters via DQ in 945 1 half star. October 28th in Madison Square Garden drew 9,000 as Von Erich pinned Bizich 1-star, 
Bulldog Drew IRS 2 stars, Mountie Pin Nightheart Dud, Flare Pin Piper 3 and 1 half stars, Bossman Pin Mustafa Dud, Heart Pin Berserker 2 stars, Matador Pin Hercules 3 stars and Low Beat Disasters via DQ 1 star. Next MSG is November 30 with Nasty Boys vs. Rockers, Virgil vs. Skinner, IRS vs. Bossman, Hart vs. Mountie for the IC title and Hogan vs. Flair. WCW Most of the major news stems from the injury situation and news from Sunday's pay-per-view show. It appears Bobby Eaton is going to turn heel, and that it won't be the only turn. Obviously the Young Pistols are another and the Freebirds are pretty well established as full-fledged faces and Medusa as a full-fledged heel. October 25th in Birmingham drew 2,500 as Pistols beat Sergeant Buddy Lee Parker and Doug Summers. PN News pinned Axel Rotten, Big Van Vader pinned Joey Mags, Thomas Rich pinned Mike Graham, Big Josh pinned Johnny B. Bad, Cactus Jack pinned Bobby Eaton, Dustin Rhodes beat Steve Austin via DQ, Rick Steiner beat Abdullah the Butcher via Countout, Enforcers beat Freebirds and Lex Luger pinned Tom Zank. Correction from last week regarding Arachnaman, Spider-Man is owned by Marvel Comics, the same company that owns the Hulk trademark, not DC Comics. On this past weekend's WCW during the Austin vs. Graham TV title match, Jim Ross made some comments regarding that you wouldn't believe the big guys that don't want any part of Mike Graham. You'd never believe the names he's backed down. They use way too much of that tinny fake crowd noise during the show which ruins the atmosphere, but I guess it was necessary because when Van Hammer does his three-clap routine, the audience at center stage breaks into a We Want Flair staccato chant and the chants at Casmere were also audible, but drowned out enough by the fake crowd noise. They need a good job on television editing out the Casmere run-in during the Eaton and Sting vs. Abdullah and Jack match which occurred too early. A few event coordinators, Ron West and Dan Redman, have been let go because WCW doesn't plan on running many, if any shows in Mississippi slash Alabama and Missouri respectively in the near future. I believe Don Glass has been reassigned as well to a front office position. Joe Blanchard, former Southwest Championship wrestling promoter, was fired as the head of the ring crew when the tour hit the Southwest and West Coast over the fiasco in Phoenix, when the ropes were too short for the size of the ring and the card had to be cancelled, although those close to him say he was a scapegoat for disorganization stemming from the home front. WCW received a reported $35,000. Guaranteed to run a card on Halloween night in Phoenix as part of the Arizona State Fair, so from a financial standpoint, that will be a successful show. World Championship Wrestling and Main Event both drew 2.4 ratings on October 19th and October 20th respectively, which are okay compared to some of the poor ratings of the summer, but for this time of the year when the ratings traditionally kick back up, they're not that hot either. Power Hour did a 1.5. How'd you like those? Tombstones at the Havoc Show in the Entrance Way? Instead of have a bunch of tombstones that looked like they were written by dyslexics, they should have at least had a sense of humor about them. At a Weeder Bodybuilding Show last year, they did the same thing but the tombstones had the names of all the bodybuilders that jumped to WBF. The possibilities there were endless. The Reader's Pages Lance Levine of Chicago, Illinois 60609 is looking for the October 15th episode of Who is the Boss and Can Trade WCW and WWF Tapes in Exchange. Greg Anderson of 71 B Vase Drive, Kelso Washington 98626 would like to trade current Portland tapes in exchange for current Japan tapes. Charles Warburton of Staten Island, New York 10312 is looking for WCW stomp cards number 4, 7, 9, 10, 17, 19, 20, 22, 68, 70, 71, 84, 92, 106, 119, 120, 128, 151, 153 and 154 in mint condition. He will trade videos in exchange. Joseph Giannotto of Mount Vernon, New York 10552 is looking for someone who can supply him with regular All Japan, New Japan, SWS and All Japan women tapes, and can trade anything in his collection in exchange for them. Christopher Love of Hendersonville, Tennessee 37077 is selling his entire collection of wrestling items dating back to the 1940s, along with ring robes, and a wrestling ring and trailer. Larry Doyle of North Whittier, California 90601 is looking for videotapes from the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles from the early 70s to the 1980s and also any West Coast videotapes of Pat Patterson, Rocky Johnson, Black Gordman and Goliath and the Guerrero Brothers, and will trade anything in his collection in exchange for them. Paul Miller of Los Angeles, California 90066 is looking for VHS or beta tapes of past and present wrestling from Europe. R.J. Freddy of Santa Rosa, California 95401 is interested in talking with others with the aim of promoting major independent wrestling shows in the Bay Area. 
Frank Carr of Chicago, Illinois 60645 has a video list. Dean Polsky of Fresh Meadows, New York 11365 is looking to trade a large list of concert and music videos for wrestling videos. Ashul Maldonado of Corona, New York 11368 is interested in getting a tape of the September 23rd match with Fujinami vs. Muda and also looking for a tape of the September 21st New Japan show. Buva Fruth of a Power Lid Wigschiffen, West Germany has the October 3rd WWF show from Royal Albert Hall in England on tape and NTSC and is looking to trade it for tapes of JWP and TWA cards that feature Medusa. Don Lewift of Westchester, Pennsylvania 19380 is looking for buy tapes of WWF house shows from 1980 present, good heart tapes and any tapes from Japan. Ricky Short of Gretna, Virginia 24557 is looking for WCW worldwide wrestling shows from July and August of 1991. Richard Ingram of Tampa, Florida 33616 is looking for tapes of Jimmy Backlund from Japan and has tapes of Florida Independence and other Florida tapes from 1986 TP89 to offer in exchange. Jonathan Fogelman of Mill Village, New York 11379 is looking for old wrestling observer yearbooks. Steve Hellwagon of Circleville, Ohio 43113 is looking to buy results bulletins from the mid-70s and early 80s, particularly 1973-81. Australia I couldn't let some of Sal Corrente's comments in the October 7th Observer go unchallenged. I have no complaints with Sal's comments about the IWA success in Sydney. They attracted good crowds during their month-long stay. It would seem that their success annoyed local wrestlers, particularly Ken Dunlop and Wayne Pickford. However, his comment that Australia has small club shows featuring very poor quality wrestling was totally uncalled for. The club shows may be small and some of the wrestling is below average, but there are many good workers in Sydney that do their best to keep wrestling alive in Australia. American wrestling groups may tour Australia once every five years. It is the local guys who wrestle each week, not for the money, but because they love what they are doing. As for good workers, at top of the list are Dunlop and Pickford. These guys were both trained by Roy Heffernan and have learned their craft well. There are also young up-and-comers like Ace Fenton, the Blade Runner and Skyhawk, who reminds me of the Lightning Kid. These five guys could all easily make it in Japan if they were given a chance. If the shows have a fault, it is that they have no television exposure, or poorly booked at times with little imagination in their angles. However, when any of those five get together for a match, the fans can be sure they'll get an entertaining match with plenty of high spots. I was confused when Sal talked about the Australian Wrestling Federation. As far as I'm aware, there isn't one. If Larry O'Day wants to call himself that, that's fine. I'm also confused when he called Dunlop and Company an outlaw group. Australia has too few wrestlers to even have a group, let alone an outlaw group. The IWA's tour was a financial success, but they did little to help the wrestling scene in Australia. Their television performances were embarrassing. Kimala and Paul Orndorff wrecked the television studio on our version of Wide World of Sports. They may have thought it was a fun angle at the time, but the hosts of the show thought they were a bunch of morons, and probably won't ever invite wrestlers to the studio again. Their appearance on a midday talk show was just as bad. Sal complained about the quality of the Australian wrestling, but he conveniently forgets about the performances of Jules Strongbow and Cousin Luke in their television match, which was one of the worst matches of all time. The comment that everyone on the tour worked hard was a bit hard to swallow, since Luke couldn't work to save his life. Perhaps Dunlop and Pickford did shoot their mouths off too much, but I believe what they said reflected what many Australian fans felt about the IWA tour. Dan Leonard Loxton, Australia. I'm writing about two letters in the October 7th issue, one from Sal Corrente and the other from Parts Unknown. I'm not in a position to pass judgment on the standard of the wrestling shows at Wonderland since I was unable to attend. However, the credibility of our tag team champions, Ken Dunlop and Wayne Pickford was slandered by the comments of Corrente. Dunlop and Pickford are far superior to any tag team that was at Wonderland. I've seen most of the guys who were here, and only Paul Orndorff and Larry Cameron can be considered fair to good workers. In his day Orndorff was very good, but injuries have certainly taken a toll on him. Although an imposing figure, Cameron gets by more on his presence than actual ability. The rest of the troupe was made of journeyman wrestlers. Ken and Wayne with their Japanese-like style, superior work rate, psychology and all-round ability far surpassed the talent level of the guys at Wonderland. The inclusion of them would surely have seen a dramatic improvement to the talent roster on hand. Why didn't you call them, Sal? You would have liked what you had seen, at least if you would have been able to alter your Ray Charles stance when you said the quality of the wrestling in Australia is very poor. To me, that's a slap in the face of the Australian wrestling fans, especially when you consider Ken and Wayne were both recommended to Shohei Baba by Lou Thez and Roy Heffernan.
Gary Cooper. Sydney, New South Wales, Australia. Hogan. Regarding Hogan's statement that he was under the good Dr. Zarian's care for a muscle injury, why would someone seek treatment from a urologist for sports-related injuries? You recently reported that Demolition was back as a tag team in Japan, for SWS. Who was under the paint? Dave Kerstetter. Edgewater Park, New Jersey. DM, Zarian is both a urologist and an osteopath. Demolition in Japan was Smash, Barry Darso, and Crush, Brian Adams.